I forgot what time it was because technical issues do exist. Um, welcome to United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. Uh, we, this is our second presentation for the year on back on site. So we do have a live audience here on site. We also are live streaming this on our YouTube channel. So if you ever can't make it here, you can check us out there. Um, I just figured that would be important to know. We do have, in addition to live streaming, it our YouTube also has all of our past presentations on there as well. A couple things uh, before we get underway. For those of you who are there, or for who are here, um, be kind. Uh, if you are not feeling well and whatnot, please do maintain a little bit of social distancing. Um, right now, it is a bit chilly and very overcast. So hopefully, that'll clear up and we will be able to see the stars tonight. Uh, who knows the weather? Unfortunately, they have not given me control of for the weather machine yet. So um, we are a nonprofit organization. Everything we have done has been through support and volunteers, both for monetarily from the public like you guys, and also our time for volunteers. So do ask questions of anyone you see uh, wearing a name tag. We'll be more than happy to either answer or if we don't know, look up or make up an answer. <laughs> yes, some, some of the facts are a little more obscure, like how, how much time would it take to travel to Jupiter? That I do not know, but 13 days. <laughs> I didn't, just didn't tell you how fast you need to be going to do that. <laughs> so uh, we do have a museum and a little gift shop inside our house. If you do need to use the restroom, we have the restroom to my right, your left, um, and the little sheds out there all each contain a telescope. And like I said, as long as it clears up, hopefully we'll get to use them tonight. Um, do avoid using bright uh, flashlights. If you are using a flashlight, please keep it aimed towards the ground. No one particularly likes getting blinded. That being said, when you go to leave tonight, do use your headlights. It hurts to get run over. Then they're done that would not suggest it. So do use your headlights when leaving. It is a safety feature, not a flaw. Um, you can check us out on our website, uacnj.org. And that is where you'll find all the information on our member clubs and as well as all the telescopes and a bit about what we do. 
You can also check us out on our social media. We got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We got a Discord channel. Like I said, you can check us out on our YouTube. And with that, we're going to be getting into our presentation. So last we had a bit of a switch up. Originally, the presentation this week was supposed to be, so you got a telescope, now what, with Paul Fisher. Um, but because our longtime presenter, uh, Lonnie, uh, fell last week and was not able to make it, uh, we did uh, this week's presentation last week. So this week, we're doing last week's presentation, just to really confuse everyone. So tonight's presentation is going to be What's Overhead in the First Month of Spring? Uh, it's a spoof uh, off of Lonnie's uh, presentation, and it was put together with much help from him. I believe we're actually using his PowerPoint. Um, so a little bit about Lonnie, who it is his press based on his presentation and whatnot. He has been obsessed with all things outer space. He does hold a degree from Stevens Institute of Technology, and he has given the what's up in the the this month's sky talk for a very long time now. Um, we're looking forward to having him back, hopefully soon. Um, but in the meantime, we got Paul covering for him, and sorry, Paul also has a degree from Stevens Institute of Technology, or maybe Lonnie doesn't have it. No, now, we're, we're both alum of uh, ah, Stevens. I haven't messed it up. Occasionally, it gets confusing. But uh, let's see. Paul has been interested in space for a very long time, ever since he looked up into the night sky on a cold night, much like tonight, on his roof. Uh, he is currently the president of United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey and has been a long time help and uh, fixture here. And with that, let's give it up for Paul. Thank you, Kim. Hello, everyone. Just going to switch uh, presentations here on us, uh, switching off of our. Introductory slide and here is. Let's see here. Slideshow from the beginning. Good place to start. And uh, was expecting the presenter's view, and I'm not getting it. But I think I can work this way. All right. I might have to shuffle around a little bit, but we can do it. All right. So uh, what's up in the... Uh, April Sky is Lonnie's uh, presentation. Uh, Lonnie is, uh, you see here his name right here. Let's see, there we go. Lonnie's uh, right here is a member of, and let me get this right here, the uh, International Association of Astronomical Artists and uh, I, here we go, sorry about this, no, it's just not working, I'm sorry, no, hold on one second, sorry about this everybody, here's the problem, I'm on the wrong, there we go, there we go. All right, uh, so uh, Lonnie is uh, uh, a member of uh, the International Association of Astronomical Artists. Uh, our, our live audience, uh, speaking of uh, artistry, our live audience has a treat tonight. Uh, if you could uh, take a step inside after the presentation, there is an actual original painting by Lonnie uh, hung inside the uh, presentation area inside and uh, so if everyone that is right by the uh, doorway if everyone could go in and take a look at it uh, then uh, that would be great uh, so uh, 
uh, Lon uh, Lonnie's representing the astronomical artists uh, in uh, many forms, and we'll get into that in a little bit a little bit later. But definitely take a look at his painting. Uh, and but uh, as Kim said, Lon uh, Lonnie's not able to uh, join us tonight, so you're going to get a completely different uh, uh, presentation. Instead of what's up in the April sky, I'm going to present what is overhead at night during the first month of spring, completely different. And th that's not true at all, of course. It's completely the same. This is basically Lonnie's presentation. I added a few, th uh, a few notes just to help me along. Uh, just uh, letting everyone know for everything that's right and correct and good with this presentation, uh, Lonnie gets all the credit for putting all that together. And uh, anything that is incorrect and bad, uh, you, everyone can blame me. Uh, Lonnie put this up front here. Uh, some of the uh, uh, some of these events, etc., uh, came from, and some of the information came from this website here, uh, Go Astronomy. This is the uh, main address up here. So go ahead and check that out uh, for other months or anytime you're unable to come up here and, and listen to Lonnie talk. This would be a good resource for you to use to find out what are the events. To, uh, happening in the sky where you happen to be at the moment. All right, so what events are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, April 1st already happened, uh, the new moon. That's the, that's the uh, one where you can't see it, right? The full moon uh, is called the pink moon on the 16th, so we're working towards that. Uh, comet pan stars, uh, the perihelion. Uh, that's when it's closest to the sun. That's on April 20th. The April 22nd to the 23rd is the Lyrid meteor shower. April 29th, Mercury is at its greatest eastern elongation. And eastern elongation is uh, the furthest distance to the side, basically, uh, uh, east uh, of the sun. And when it's to the east of the sun, it is actually at night, and uh, so that is uh, a good time to see it. And then April 30th is another new moon phase. So those are the April events that we're going to be talking about today. However, uh, we can't forget our old friends and uh, some of the things that we might see if the clouds <laughs> disappear on us. Uh, we can't forget our old friends, uh, the stars and the deep sky objects that are up this time every year. They're not transient events. They, uh, if you come back here on April 9th and stand in the same place and look in the same place, you'll see these objects in the exact same place. Not quite the exact. They do move around, but they move around so slowly compared to our uh, obs observation capabilities that to humans in the human lifetime, uh, unless you're using really sophisticated instruments, you won't be able to tell the difference that they moved. Uh, this is a great resource, uh, the reason I put this up. To find uh, these objects, I use uh, Sky Maps myself. That's skymaps.com there. It gives you uh, a map that looks like this. You can see here, uh, and it goes on to a second page. It starts listing the objects, etc., that happen to be. The second page would be a list similar to the, these here, that uh, would show you uh, uh, all the objects that happen to be up uh, uh, that month. They do happen. Uh, they they do update this uh, sky map monthly, and it's a great resource for you to look at. And this format, in case you don't know what that is, uh, we do have uh, a, uh, a navigation guide, an atlas type of thing called a planisphere. This is very similar to how a planisphere is laid out, these maps. So it's useful. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything that was on that, la um, the, that map because, like I said, it's two pages long. But here are some of the things that... Uh, the guys over there, uh, if we do get cloud cover, uh, are likely or can uh, put uh, the, the telescopes on and uh, will um, 
and you can view. Uh, M35, uh, it's in the constellation Gemini, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't have a, a non-catalog uh, name uh, like the other ones do, so I felt bad for it, so I put in the, an alternate catalog name in there, and uh, that's an open cluster. In uh, It's on the feet of one of the twins of Gemini. Uh, ca uh, catalog M51, it's in the uh, constellation, and I'm going to need help here. Uh, Cani Venae Tisi. Uh, that's at least uh, the, the pronunciation guide. It's basically underneath the Big Dipper, underneath the handle of the Big Dipper. It's the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's a cool galaxy. It's, uh, it's a spiral. Um, there's an uh, associated galaxy, a smaller galaxy with it, and yet it actually looks like one gal the bigger galaxies uh, sucking the little galaxy down into it. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, it's whirlpool not only in the fact that it looks like a spiral galaxy and it looks like a whirlpool, but it actually looks like the two galaxies are uh, interacting with each other. So it's a cool looking object. M81 is a uh, Bode's galaxy. That's also a spiral, and that is in Ursa Major or where the Big Dipper is. Uh, M42 is the Orion Nebula, and I think we are getting to the last dregs of being able to see the Orion Nebula at night. Uh, it, is, it is getting closer and closer to the west, and the days are getting longer and longer, so we're going to lose it soon. So if we have the opportunity to see it, it doesn't look like we are, but if we have the opportunity to see it tonight, uh, take a look. The Orion Nebula is a very spectacular galaxy. It is a, a diffuse nebula. Uh, M44 is in Cancer. It's the Beehive Cluster. It's an op It's another open cl uh, cluster. And then finally, M13 is the big daddy of uh, globular clusters in the Northern Hemisphere. It's in Hercules, and it's the Hercules Great Globular Cluster. There's uh, something like, uh, they say, up to a million stars in the globular cluster. Also, uh, these are stars I listed down here. Polaris, everyone knows. Mizar and Alcor is in the, is in, uh, the Big Dipper. Castor and Pollux are the two heads in Gemini. They'll be overhead tonight. Arcturus is, um, ask someone to explain how to find Arctu Arcturus. Another bright star. It is uh, easy to find off of the Big Dipper. Uh, Spica is easy to find off of Arcturus and Capella and one of the, uh, the brightest star, uh, excuse me, besides the sun in the northern hemisphere is Sirius. It's actually uh, below the equator, so it's probably a uh, bright star down in, uh, down in the southern hemisphere too. All right, so let's get into some of the... Uh, transient objects uh, we were talking about from the original list. Uh, this is Comet C 202103 Pan Stars, and we have uh, uh, some things to go over about it, but first I wanted to everyone to see this is obviously uh, the inner solar system here, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The sun's right there in the center, and this is a uh, the orbit or the path of um, C202103 pan stars. Uh, we'll go over some of this stuff in a minute, but this curve here, I wanted to, anyone can understand these vertical lines. What do these vertical lines mean? Anyone want to take a guess? Our live audience here, anyone? Uh, the tail is a good guess. It is not the tail, I don't believe. Anyone else? Margin of error for where it might Margin go? Margin of error, a bar is sometimes used to, to uh, so another good guess. Uh, what I think it is is a visualization of where it is above or below the ecliptic plane. Everyone's aware that our solar system is basically a plate. It's basically flat. And, the, uh, and the, uh, these vertical lines tell you that it's starting above the plane of the solar system, dipping underneath around the sun, and then back up. So it is not uh, 
it's not in the plane of our solar system. And that tells us something about it, which I will go into uh, next. Uh, PanSTARRS telescope uh, uh, first observed it in uh, July 26, 2021. That's this portion of its name. That's why uh, it is. this is the telescope or the telescope group that uh, found, the, uh, found the comet. So that's that portion of the name. It's a 1.8 uh, meter telescope in, uh, I'm not going to be able to say that name correct, an observatory in Hawaii. Uh, Perihelion is April 20th, uh, 2022, uh, and it's, uh, it's a 0.29 AU from the sun. AU is an astronomical unit. That is the distance from the, uh, the average distance from the Earth to the sun. So it's one third or about the distance from the sun to Mercury that the, uh, that the, uh, the comet will approach the sun. Its maximum visual magnitude is about five and that maximum visual added uh, uh, magnitude uh, unfortunately will occur when it is close to the sun, which will make it difficult for us to see uh, unfortunately. Uh, May 18th, uh, 2022, will be the nearest approach to the Earth at 0.6 AU from the Earth, and it'll have a visual magnitude of 6.8. That's uh, still very visible uh, in binoculars and uh, the, a telescope. Uh, harder to see up here in the, uh, where we are. Uh, in fact, near impossible, I believe, in this area. Uh, late April to May, it moves across Aries, Taurus, Perseus, and... Uh, this guy, which I will also not pronounce, another uh, constellation. Uh, May 2nd, uh, it'll uh, have a, uh, I don't know whether it's a technical definition of a conjunction, but it'll be very close to these other objects. May 2nd, it'll be a uh, waxing moon, uh, a uh, relatively bright Mercury, uh, C2022, uh, 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 202103 will appear near the Pleiades also. So those four objects will be relatively close to each other in the sky, and all four will fit in the field of view of a wide-angle binoculars. So uh, relatively close. Uh, the other things I wanted to mention about and why I wanted to tell, tell you about the eccentricity of that orbit, why it's, uh, it goes both below and above the uh, the plane of the solar system is that this is a visitor from an from the Oort cloud. It's a non-periodic uh, comet, and that's what this C designates right here. C will designate a non-periodic comet. All right, so it's not coming back, most likely. It'll probably be ejected from the solar system, and it comes all the way out from the Oort cloud, which is up to a light year away from our uh, sun so really far away. It took millions of years for it to get to the sun. This is the path. Um, let me, sh following the uh, bouncing uh, red light here, it goes like this. And these are the constellations in the sky. And this is the path it'll take in our night sky uh, over the course of time. Here it's starting in September of 2021, and you can see it's uh, circling around here, and right, we're right around here, in between, uh, did I write it down? I didn't, but that's, um, uh, that's Cetus and Pisces. It's in between Cetus and Pisces right now, and unfortunately tonight it's already set. It's set around 6.30 this evening, so we won't be able to see it here tonight. Here is the that, uh, like I said, maybe not the technical definition of a conjunction, but here's Mercury, the moon, and the comet doesn't seem to be identified, but I'm guessing this might be the comet. And then uh, 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 these are the Pleiades. The uh, Pleiades sort of look like uh, uh, a mini version of the Big Dipper, doesn't it, when you look at it uh, a little bit closer? And here on the um, here on the uh, the sky atlas that uh, we're using here, which I believe is uh, Stellarium. Uh, this uh, happens May second, twenty twenty two. 
And so uh, Stellarium lets us put in the date ahead of time and uh, show you what the event will look like on your computer. This is Mercury, and uh, believe it or not, one of my guests looking at this, that it is uh, another object. What kind of what kind of it does it look like? Because it it is a crescent. It looks like the moon, is, but cr crescents happen on the inner planets uh, also when they are at the uh, various elongations, uh, because the sun will be here compared to, uh, I'm um, oh, sorry, let me put it here so everyone can see it. The sun will be here uh, off the screen this direction. And uh, so it's the light is illuminating only that side of Mercury. And so this side looks dark to us. And that is why we get a crescent on the inner planets. So that is what's happening with Mercury at the end of the uh, at the end of the uh, month. Uh, we want to always be careful, a little careful with Mercury. Mercury is never that far from the Sun, and one thing you definitely don't want to do, even by mistake, is look at the Sun without a solar filter through any type of magnifying device. So when one looks at Mercury, which isn't that far from the sun, one needs to be very, very careful and sure of what you're doing. So if you're uh, going to take out your binoculars or take out your telescope, you want to make sure that you are not facing the sun at all. So be very sure of that. If you're not sure, just don't do it. You can get blind by, by doing that you know, or injure one, your uh, one eye. Uh, that you're using, or both eyes if you're using binoculars, pretty badly by doing that. So don't do that. Just be careful. Let's talk about the, uh, the Lyrids. Uh, the Lyrids are happening April 16th, almost, uh, you know, in uh, uh, seven days to uh, April 25th. The peak is uh, the 22nd through the 23rd. Uh, and uh, the Lyrids are called the Lyrids because the radiant is in the constellation Lyra. Uh, and Lyra, uh, Vega is coming up, uh, will, is low in the eastern sky uh, uh, now or in a little bit. And uh, so uh, that will rise during the course of the night and the radiant will rise with it. What is a radiant? Uh, a radiant is the area in the sky which all of the meteors look like they're originating from. Now, why do they look like that? And I, I wrote down here the garden hose analogy. If you take a, like a garden hose, and I'm spraying it directly at the audience here, the earth goes through that spray like that. So the radiant would be the nozzle of the garden hose. So that's what's happening. The uh, water droplets, or in this case the comets, are, come, are a big, uh, you can consider it a big spray of water in the sky, or a big spray of comet dust in the sky. And so that radiant is that nozzle that we are, that the earth is uh, flying through. That's what's happening. That's why it appears all the comets are coming through uh, the radiant, and that's how the uh, meteor showers are named. Uh, the Perseids, uh, let's, let's go to a couple more facts here. Uh, the Lyrids are about 5 to 20 meteors per hour, uh, averaging about uh, 10 per hour. Uh, the uh, other, uh, uh, excuse me, meteor showers such as the Perseids and Leonids, average rates in the thousands of meteors per hour. So you can see that the Lyrids are not a spectacular meteor shower, pretty limited. That doesn't mean that seeing a uh, shooting star in the sky isn't cool whenever you get a chance to see it, so it's still worth checking out. But just don't expect thousands of meteors per hour. Uh, the uh, 
The Lyrids are uh, remnants of the comet uh, C1861 G1 Thatcher. Uh, that comet uh, last visited us in 1861. So that uh, comet uh, hasn't been around since that date, and it has a period of 415 years, so we're not expecting it uh, for a while yet. It's, uh, uh, it has 110 uh, AU uh, aphelion. That is, uh, in other words, it, is, uh, a, uh, it goes past Eris, and Eris is the second most massive trans-Newtonian uh, dwarf, dwarf planet in our solar system. In other words, it goes out to around where, or past where Pluto is. Okay, so that's how far that comet goes out and then comes back in. That's why it takes so long to get back here. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that I said here um, that the C uh, designates a uh, non-periodic comet. Why is this not a P? Uh, C, yeah, C designates a non-periodic comet, but we are calling it a long-period comet. So why is this not a P? And that's because 1861 is the first time that we uh, uh, recorded its trip through our solar system. And so we have to verify that it shows up again in a, another 200 and some odd years. Once we do that, that C will change to a P and that will be designated a periodic comet. So, so until we confirm that it actually is a periodic comet by seeing it come through again, that's going to remain a C. And uh, like I said, uh, 687 uh, BCE is the, uh, uh, w oh, uh, yeah, what is this 687 BCE uh, then? Well, uh, although we haven't verified that the comet has shown up uh, the, uh, only this one time in 1861, we have noticed the Lyrids have been happening since 600. Uh, 87 BC, and uh, Chinese astronomers actually found those and recorded the Lyrids um, at that point. So that's why. So we know that's why we know it's a long period comet, and that it's probably coming back again. But we don't actually we haven't actually verified the comet itself has made it back yet. All right. So uh, I uh, these. Um, These slides, especially these two here, uh, these are these are definitely Stellarium, a uh, online atlas, very useful. Like I said, you can put in the date, and you'll get the picture of the in the sky. Uh, here is the information on Stellarium. You can get both a computer uh, application and a uh, uh, phone app. So uh, Stellarium is uh, something you can play around with at home. This was a blank slide, uh, probably a broken link or something. I, I don't know <laughs> what Lonnie intended for it, unfortunately. Uh, Celestia.space is another resource for r 3D real-time visualiz vis visualization of space. Lonnie does a lot of, um, besides the painting inside, a lot of his artwork is associated with uh, putting uh, uh, mapping uh, visual representations of the, say, the surface of uh, Mars and actually mapping that onto a 3D model of Mars. So uh, it's uh, technical in the sense that the uh, maps will correspond, uh, will correspond correctly to their positions on a globe of Mars. So uh, Lonnie does a lot of that work too. So he, uh, a lot of real-time 3D visualizations is right down uh, Lonnie's Alley, so something you might want to check out. Uh, Space.com is another um, uh, uh, resource. Skyandtelescope.com is another resource. We also uh, want to mention uh, this. This is actually very timely. Uh, Lonnie put this in for the beginning of April. He was due to give a talk on the 2nd. Uh, space, uh, his uh, contribution here was SpaceX uh, Axiom 1 
uh, astronaut mission to the space station was delayed to April 6. It actually ended up getting uh, uh, delayed to yesterday, so I updated that information there. Uh, these gentlemen, uh, uh, one of them is uh, Michael uh, Lopez uh, Alegria here, I was, is a uh, former NASA astronaut. The other gentlemen here are uh, private astronauts who uh, contr also contributed money to the mission. Uh, they are all uh, pri now private astronauts, so this is the first private astronaut crew uh, going uh, to the space station. Uh, you know, the entire crew is uh, private. Uh, just this morning, they actually got there and docked. So this is them uh, very close to approaching. This is them. I don't know whether they're quite locked on all the way here, but uh, cl uh, a bit closer to docking. And here's them uh, with the rest of the International Space Station uh, crew actually arrived safely up at the space station. So they're there now. Uh, these uh, these uh, pictures can be attributed to NASA TV, to SpaceX, and the Axiom uh, uh, people. And uh, let's see here. I'm just uh, taking, uh, took a step back to take a look at my uh, notes here. Uh, these so even though these are private and uh, s s they are uh, self-funding in a way, uh, you would think that that's completely to space tourism. That's not true. Uh, they will be. Uh, uh, they will also be conducting real science while they're up there. Uh, they launched 11:17 a.m. yesterday and uh, docked uh, complete. That's actually locked on, uh, and all the checks made. I imagine at 8:41 a.m. Uh, this morning. Uh, they are anticipating another mi uh, pr completely private crew mission uh, next year. Uh, something else in history, uh, the uh, NASA uh, last year, uh, about this time of year, NASA successfully flies its drone helicopter Ingenuity on Mars it's the first powered aircraft to fly in another world. Uh, so far, they've had 24 successful flights as of uh, April 5th. Um, their flights average or can go as long as, excuse me, I should say, 167 seconds each flight. At, uh, or it could go a maximum of like 2,050 th feet. The original mission scope was uh, one to five flights. So uh, 20, uh, 24 successful flights is uh, much beyond what they originally anticipated. There might be a little bit of under-promise, over-perform going on there, but uh, ne nevertheless, uh, designing a, uh, a uh, atmospheric flying machine, a helicopter, and... Uh, having it successfully fly on another planet, one cannot underestimate how impressive that is. Uh, people, people sometimes say, oh, we don't even really know how uh, flight works uh, uh, I here on Earth. Well, we have a couple of uh, issues we'd like to know a little bit more, but uh, this thing would not take off on another planet if we didn't know, actually know how flight works. So we have a pretty good idea of how it works. Mars atmosphere is extremely different from the Earth's atmosphere. It's very thin compared to our atmosphere. All right, uh, Lonnie, well, uh, the, the, the old joke, uh, Pete and repeat are sitting on the fence, right? So uh, we're going to, Pete fell off and we're going to repeat, all right? And this is Lonnie's version of the joke that uh, probably is Pete. Uh, so uh, let's review the events. Uh, April 1st was the new, moon, new first new moon this uh, month. April 16th was the full moon phase, the pink moon, uh, or will be the f full moon phase, the pink moon. Uh, April 20th, uh, comet Pan-STARRS uh, Pan will be at perihelion. Uh, 
Uh, April 22nd through the 23rd is the peak of the Lyrid meteor shower. April 29th, uh, Mercury's greatest eastern elongation. Uh, and the, our second new moon phase in April will happen on the 30th. Uh, here are some references that we went over. United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey, uh, the magazine Sky and Telescope and Astronomy.com, programs and apps Stellarium, uh, StellariumWeb.org, Stellarium Mobile, and uh, Celestia Space. And Lonnie is uh, here at this email address. He's a member of the Int International Association of Ast Astronomical Artists. Uh, he has a website related to that um, uh, 3D modeling of, uh, of, uh, uh, of planets and other things, uh, astronomyinmotion.com. You can see his work there. And uh, Mars at your fingertips. I had mentioned Mars as part of that 3D modeling. That's part of it. And here's a book uh, from Lonnie, or a, uh, excuse me, a CD from Lonnie, uh, Space History uh, Mysteries Solved with Animation and Interactive Virtual Reality. Go check out Lonnie's stuff, impressive stuff. Like I said, there is a, uh, uh, a painting inside, which since it's uh, dripping a little bit, might be excellent to check out, uh, uh, inside by Lonnie. And that is our uh, presentation for the evening. Uh, and just remember, uh, everyone, we are a volunteer organization. Please be generous. Please do uh, donate. And remember, uh, do use your headlights when you leave. Do, do use low lights to navigate around. And these are our uh, various social media uh, sites. All right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everyone who came out. All right. So like I said, uh, since we do have an in-person crowd and an online crowd, we are going to be doing a Q&A session. Um, before that, I noticed a couple people showed up in the middle of the presentation. Not a problem. Just want to go over a couple things. If you need to use the restroom, that is the porta potty to my right, your left, lit up by the red light. Um, we do have telescopes I don't I don't think they're necessarily open because it is uh, drippy and we do like to protect the expensive equipment speaking of which I'm shutting down my computer sorry everybody yeah um, like uh, Paul said we do have the gift shop and a little bit of the museum inside uh, we do have a couple of questions I'm gonna start off with one from uh, our online audience would the comment be visible from UACNJ uh, not until, uh, like I said, it's set now and it's setting door, door, uh, during the day, but as it moves along that curve I showed you, uh, it should be up uh, later in the evening. And uh, so as it gets closer to the Earth, it should be uh, more visible at night. All right. Was there a question from our audience here? I'll bring over the mic so that the online audience could hear. Anyone? Questions? Everyone's uh, like, we're out of here. It's <laughs> raining. We, we, we did get a, a, a bit of an uh, increase in the precipitation. Uh, I do have a couple other questions from our online audience, though. Um, someone wanted to know, do you know how they control the drone? It, meaning, like, what technology is used? Is it controlled by them doing inputs, or is it an AI? There is, uh, I'm sure there is an AI component. I'm sure it receives commands. Uh, and uh, there is localized control as well as uh, mission control control. But how that is accomplished and to what level each one is, uh, is uh, what's that called? Uh, uh, you know, how self-sufficient it is versus how much is direct driving. Uh, I don't know. You probably have to look at the NASA uh, websites to, to get more information on that. All uh, right, and the last one is, uh, someone said, is Lonnie okay? Lonnie is okay, he is doing better. Um, and like I said, we are looking to get have him back soon, so. Well, I did actually correspond with Lonnie. He did say that he is improving uh, and that, uh, uh, that it's uh, going slowly but surely. So we hope to have him uh, 
we hope to have him back soon, but more importantly, we hope to, uh, that he heals up uh, well so we can have him back again fully when he does come back. All right. Were there any questions? Bueller? Bueller? All right. So with that, uh, I want to, again, thank you guys for showing up. Uh, do check us out on our website, uacnj.org. And you can also uh, reach us out to us through our Facebook. We have Instagram, Twitter. We have a Discord channel, which uh, I know I'm personally in there. So feel free to ask questions there. Uh, we also now have a Patreon, so do sign up. Uh, it's a, You can do small monthly donations there, or if you don't want to do a recurring donation, you can check us out. Uh, we have a PayPal. If you don't have any money to give, that's perfectly fine. Do like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. It does help us out greatly so that more people can find us and find out more about our programs. And with that, have a good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.